You're listening to The Lindia Grant Show. Think on these things with Lindia Grant. So good evening, Radio 1 listeners. Thank you for tuning in to The Lindia Grant Show. We are here every Friday, and starting next month, we're celebrating our 15th anniversary. We've actually been on 14 years on this station, but I count the year that I substitute for Barbara Lett Simmons. So for me, it's 15. So let's just make sure nobody thinks I'm cheating. It's our 15th anniversary of being on Radio One, Spirit 1340 WYCB. And hope you all have been enjoying, enjoying our programming. We started off with Adrian Washington, but she's been sick for several years now. And so blessed and thankful that we have gotten someone with the status of Dr. Julianne Malvo. She's on every week with us now when she can. Sometimes she's traveling or speaking or in Africa, Europe, anywhere. I, <laughs> I love Dr. Julianne. She is so good. So today we're going to have Dr. Julianne Malvo. And then in our second half, a soror of mine by the name of Dr. Tanya Tim Taylor from Westchester University is going to be talking about pay equity. So I want you to tune in for that kind of fits in a lot with what Dr. Julian talks about, because she is an economist. But today, she can talk about whatever she pleases. Dr. Julian Malvo, do your thing. Well, greetings, Lindia. Good to be with you, as always. Uh, good to be with our sister, uh, Tanya Taylor. I know she's going to do a brilliant job. And always remembering Adrian Washington, our friend, who um, can't be with us uh, by phone, but is with us in spirit and in presence. And so just happy to be here. Now let's just begin with the economy. Usually I start with politics, but today I want to start with the economy because the Fed released a report uh, this week. They said that um, 65% of all Americans say that inflation makes them feel worse off. Um, they are looking at a progress report uh, from 2023 and they are challenged by inflation. This does not bode well for President Trump. Does not bode well for him at all. Uh, but it is what it is. Um, inflation is around, and actually, it went up to 3.4 percent last month from from a year ago. That is challenging. Um, but I would ask people to look at what they're spending on, what is hitting them hard and whether or not they feel that's the president's fault, because much of this is not the president's fault, but it doesn't make you feel any better when you have to uh, go to the store and you find you're paying a few pennies more here, a few pennies more there, and it adds up. A friend of mine said, I once spent $100, I didn't even buy any meat. Um, So inflation Mm -hmm. is there. We don't want to make it, quote, the president's fault, but we do want to acknowledge that inflation is going to be an electoral issue. Moving right along, uh, on Tuesday, the, the orange man's uh, defense rested their case. They had, um, their witnesses were kind of catawampus. Uh, that was one of my mom's favorite words, just being uneven. They were kind of catawampus, and um, the judge had to admonish one of them to start rolling his eyes and staring and to answer questions. But, and you know, Mr. Trump said he was going to testify. Well, nobody thought he was, because why would he put himself in further jeopardy? And so he did it. But the they have arrested the case, and arresting the case, what we know is that um, it hinges on a couple of witnesses, including Michael Cohen. They are, will be deliberating next week. They have the rest of the week off. They'll be deliberating next week, and we'll see what happens. Now, exciting, exciting, exciting. I want everybody who listens to stand up and do the happy dance. Angela also Brooks won her election. She is mm-hmm. the Democratic nominee for the United States Senate from yes. Maryland. Yes. A Democratic nominee. She will be, if she is elected, and we're going to make sure she is, um, she will be only the third black woman to serve in the United States Senate. Uh, Barbara Bukowski, who was the first woman to serve in the Senate, endorsed her. She's got endorsements for all over the state of Maryland, which is a blessing. But it's going to be an uphill battle. Larry Hogan, who is the former governor of Maryland, who um, was handpicked by Mitch McConnell, 
he is her opponent on the Republican side. He is lying again. He says he supports a woman's right to choose. All of a sudden, he hasn't supported it for his whole congressional, his whole um, legislative life. But now he supports Mm -hmm. it. Come on now. He is, and his first ad came out um, on Tuesday saying he supported a woman's right to choose. You know, like my grandmother used to always say, don't pee on me and tell me it's raining. You know? (laughs) Because basically, he is, hey, he's been consistent, he's been consistent, he's been consistent. But mm-hmm. this is a, Angela beat Trone, double digits, 10%, 12%. And so, so this is going to continue. So this is going to be a fight down to the finish. But you know what? We ready for it. Everybody is ready for it. Um, RFK Jr., talk about him. His sister Carrie said that the Kennedy family is in favor of President Biden. She's been making headlines because she's talked about how he is wrong. He doesn't tell the truth. And and although she loves her brother, she wants to see him out of, he just, she does not want him to win. He is qualifying in ballots all over the country. And so this becomes a challenge. I think he's down up to 13 ballots that he's qualified for. And racist thin states, he can make the difference between Biden and Trump. He mm-hmm. can make the difference. And so we just have to keep a look on that. And all these people who want to be independent, go on with your independence. Do you want Trump? Because that's really where we are. We are not partisan on this program. We are factual. Let me just say that because I want to mm-hmm. get you in trouble. We're mm-hmm. not partisan. We're factual. But here are the facts. RFK Jr. is an anti-vaxxer. He's anti-DEI. He is not worthy of the presidency. Um, on Tuesday, in several states, people are going to the ballots. In Georgia, um, in Idaho, Kentucky, uh, Oregon. In California, they will replace Kevin McCarthy. Of course, it's likely to be a Republican, but eh, maybe not. Uh, what we're seeing, actually, is... Um, People going, this, we've begun the electoral season, Lydia. Mm-hmm. It's May, we got June, July, August, September, October. We are in the electoral season, and we hope that things will go the way they should to maintain our rights and freedoms, but it requires everybody to get out there and vote. Mm-hmm. Now, let's pivot to the Middle East for a minute. The International uh, Committee has basically censured and arrest, uh, issued arrest warrants for Netanyahu because they say that he has um, basically broken international law with the way he's treating the Gazans. But they've also issued uh, arrest warrants for three members of Hamas. President Biden is angry about that. They, he says that he, he will not put up with that. He has always been solidly in Israel's corner, but we know that there are some challenges here not just that he's in Israel's corner, but that we still see the rape, the killing uh, of of Gaza. Meanwhile, as we look at that, Lily Greenberg, who's a young Jewish woman who worked for the Department of Interior, resigned her position on May 15th. Lily Greenberg said that one of her values that she was um, raised with was to save a life is to save the world. She suggests that what Israel is doing is not saving lives, and she says that Biden, President Biden is using her community to justify slaughter. Um, she has, she's made several public statements. Most recently, she appeared on Democracy Now!, uh, the uh, Pacifica program with Amy Goodman, where she talked about why she had to resign. She's the first Jewish American to resign from a government position and she's resigned because, again, she says that this is not right and it is not fair, and she wants to see us pull back. President Biden was the Morehouse uh, last week where he did, uh, he, was, he was excellent. Anyone who says he can't talk can't hear. Mm-hmm. But he really did give a great speech, and he did talk about what was happening in Israel just very briefly because that was not the purpose, but he did in, indicate his strong support for HBCUs, 16 million, 16 billion more dollars for HBCUs, and he talked about the right that students had 
for dissent. He didn't directly address the Israel situation, but you know that he was under that cloud. There were professors who had the coffee, the scarf around their neck. There was one brother who put his fists up in the air. Um, people, HBCUs don't clown like white folks do. We know mm-hmm. they don't clown like white folks do. Um, but they are, many students are very affected by what's going on, and they want the president to do better. He did call for a ceasefire, but calling for a ceasefire at Morehouse College is like calling for, um, I don't know, the end of barbecue in Texas. In other words, those students don't have any power to do anything but listen to him. If he wants a ceasefire, go to the floor of Congress and call for it there. Mm-hmm. So that we, it, it, it's been a very busy week, and the commencement thing, of course, you know, hits me where I live as a former college president. I would not want any protests on my campus during graduation because it's a sacred time. Many people, yeah. many older people and first-generation families, they've saved and scrimped to get themselves to that campus. They want to have a pleasant time. At the same time, what I really do feel is that students do have the right to protest. Yeah, and mm-hmm. so given that we have to, I think that Morehouse College was a model for the rest of the university community. There was protest, but it was mild and it was not disruptive, mm-hmm. and the president did make a powerful statement. Wonderful. All right, with that, uh, Sal, oh, did you have anything else? I think we are at our mark. So yeah, I uh, thought we were. I mean, I could always take another minute if you want me to. Uh, no, we got to have our time <laughs> for our, our commercial break. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Julian. That was good, though. Thank uh, you. Appreciate you always. All right. All right. Next week, we can talk about whether Fannie Willis won her election or not. And I, I'm sure she will because the polls showed that she was way ahead, way ahead. I think she will. She's been talking to some of our people, mm-hmm. uh, some of the people down on the ground. And mm-hmm. um, she is an exciting sister with enormous resilience. We can all take a page from her book. Yes, indeed. All right. Thank you, Dr. Julian. We're going to go to our commercial break. And when we return, we'll be talking to Dr. Tanya Tim Taylor from Westchester University in Pennsylvania about pay equity. Back in a moment. If it wasn't for my care coach at MyHealth, I probably wouldn't be so healthy right now. As a man, you know we don't get checkups or see a doctor regularly anyways. It's probably just a man thing because none of my partners go either. We know we should, but we just don't and hope it works out. So what changed for you? AmeriHealth assigned me a care coach, somebody that gives one-on-one help, answer questions, explain things, and help set my appointments. She also helped me understand what having high blood pressure really means and ways to manage it so it doesn't kill me. It ain't nothing to play with. If you're a member of AmeriHealth, Ask for a care coach. I'm glad I got mine. At AmeriHealth, if you need a care coach, you can have one. Just call us at 1-877-759-6224 to get connected. 1-877-759-6224. This program is funded in part by the government of the District of Columbia Department of Healthcare Finance, Mayor Muriel Bowser. Washington and former religion columnist, Lindia Grant. Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on a segregated Montgomery bus. In lectures on brotherhood, Ms. Parks often said, people always say that I didn't give up my seat because I was tired. But that wasn't true. I was not tired physically. I was not old. I was 42. No, the only tired I was, was tired of giving in. Driven out of Montgomery by harassment and death threats, Detroit, Michigan became her new home. Rosa Parks will always be remembered as the mother of the civil rights movement. Raised in the AME church, she once said, I remember finding such comfort and peace while reading the Bible. Read more in the religion column of the Washington Informer, an award-winning African-American newspaper. We don't report crime or gossip, just positive news. Pick up the Washington Informer or visit us online at WashingtonInformer.com. Call 202-561-4100 for more information. This is Frank Smith with the African-American Civil War Museum in Washington, D.C., located at 1925 Vermont Avenue Northwest on the Green Line. Did you know that a recent study found that children who visit museums do better in school and in life than children who do not? So parents, teachers, and preachers, let's get moving. 
I promise you, if you bring your children to the African American Civil War Museum, they will be inspired by the images that they see. They will be impressed by our living history reenactors who are always available. And they will be involved in our scavenger hunt that takes them throughout our exhibit. That's the African American Civil War Museum, 1925 Vermont Avenue. Our hours are 10 to 6.30 on weekdays, 12 to 4 on Saturdays and Sundays. See it. Be inspired. Thank you for tuning in to the Lindia Grant Show. And we are back from our commercial break. Now for the second half of our show. I am so pleased to have with us today, Dr. Tanya Timms Taylor. First, I want to tell you she is a sorority sister of mine with Gamma Phi Delta Sorority. But in her profession, she is a professor of history at Westchester University. There at Westchester, she is active with the Frederick Douglass Institute, and she is the founding director of the African American Studies Program. Dr. Thames Tim is Dr. Thames Taylor. I have heard you speak about pay equity in a very exciting way. You argue that women, particularly black women, Pay equity should be in our conversation like recipes and like hair and fashion, something we ought to talk about all the time. Would you elaborate for us why you argue such points? Yes, and I'm going to just tell you right now, I am so excited to be here. Um, I um, listen to your program. It is so informative. It really empowers all listeners. So let me explain um, exactly what I mean. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Let me explain um, a little bit, and I'm going to go from a historical lens, and then I'm going to put it in context. And so what happens is in our conversations, right, uh, we have conversations we make um, conversations about, you know, voting, 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 right? And we go through a cycle in our organizations where we spend about six months working on voter registration drives. In about six months planning, whatever gala, chicken dinner, or whatever dinner we're going to have, and that is a cycle, right? And so mm-hmm. what happens is um, it doesn't really disrupt the system. One thing about we know if we, when, you live in, uh, when we live in this nation and we are disrupting the system or something that disrupts the system is basically get um, the spotlight. So you now have to wonder, you know, what can disrupt a system? So let me explain to you, give you some, uh, some real data. Okay, so by the year 20. 53. Now, let me put this in context. Black people are the freest that they have ever been in American society right now. In 2024, we are the freest that we've ever been. Now, I didn't say that we were totally free. I didn't say that we were totally having liberty. I said we are the freest that we've ever been. But think about this. By the year, the projections are by the year 2053, our net worth as a community will be zero. You heard what I said. By 2053, the freest that we've ever been, our um, net worth will be zero. Now, one of the things that we have to realize is that, you know, really if I had to have a thesis for this conversation about pay equity, social um, um, salary negotiation, is that at one time we were what they call chattel property. We were, you know, we were like a, you know, piece of property. And what happens is in our um financially, we still sort of in part of that um, symbolic, you know, chattel. Um, you have our community. We walk around like we're really walking billboards for a lot of brand names, but because we don't understand the difference between wealth and income, we need to start to have that conversation in our community. What's the difference between wealth? So just because somebody makes six figures or, you know, seven figures, it doesn't necessarily make them wealthy. So we have to have that conversation. Again, the difference between um, wealth and income. I'm going to come back to that in a second. But I mm-hmm. said that I was going to give some, um, some stats here, okay? First, number one, between 2014 and 2018, one in four, that's 22% of black women, lived in poverty. One. Wow. Mm-hmm. Okay. Number two. More than half of black women have no retirement savings. Number three, the average median income for black women is $36,000 a year. Number four, right, we are, when, we, when you look at our um, 
like what happens is when you look at our um, um, like average financial assets as a whole, as it, like so basically the average black woman's um, you know financial assets can range for about twenty five thousand dollars. I mean twenty five thousand, but on the median, meaning all of us put together, we're at roughly one thousand two hundred and fifty one. Now, when you sort of take that to the fact that the majority, you understand that only 41% of African Americans own homes, you have to look at a home as a savings bank. A home is something that you can have equity in and really just look at it as a savings bank. Now, think about this. Of that um, 47, um, of the 41% that own homes, right, what happens is that at a median value, it's at zero. Right, so the average home is roughly about for in our community about fifty three thousand dollars, and what happens is on a median value it's zero. Same true for black men. That's why that number in twenty um, twenty fifty three, that why that number is so crucial because you can look at our home ownership and give it as again a part of an indicator to where we headed. Now, right now, when we have in this conversation about pay equity, I want us to keep this in mind that we make only sixty nine. I mean, 69 cents of the white man's dollar. If you have a person who's working in a 40-year career, basically we are 900,000, we make $900,000 less than a white man. And that's over a 40-year career. I mean, it's not at a million, but it's certainly knocking on the door. Now, what, does the, what, what do I mean when we talk about that something called wage gap? So that means that in our wage gap, are we going to catch up to the white man's dollar on in this year in 2024, on July the 27th, 2024. So what does that mean? That means we got to get to July the 27th, 2024, to get to where a white man ended on December the 31st, 2023. That many months behind. That many months behind. Mm, mm, mm. And so what happens is now when you sort of look at this, what does this actually mean? This means that, you know, we have been sort of, um, that's why I was saying going back to that cycle. So initially voting was a gendered conversation in many ways because women were, you know, excluded to the right to vote through the 19th Amendment. And so what happens is that, so we say, okay, you know, um, you know, women need to get out, you know, people need to vote, vote, vote. We need to vote, 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 vote. But my piece is that I think that as women organizations or organizations for women and organization with civil rights, we need to have two things going on. Our number one issue needs to be pay equity. We need to push that. Number two will come voting. And let me explain what I mean by that. When you go to the gas pump and you have to look up that uptake of 87, 89, 91, or 93 uptake, you know what's going to determine which one you have if you don't have a luxury vehicle and you have to use 91? It's going to be what you have in your pocket. When you go to the grocery store and decide that you want to make hamburgers for your family, you got, I mean, you have to, you're going to use ground beef. Let's say meatloaf. You're now going to say, okay, here is 80% lean, 90% lean, 93% lean, or 96% lean. All of them are coming at a different price. What is being, what's driving what you're going, you know, what your choices are? And that is what you have in your pocket. I mm-hmm. told you that the majority, right, I share with you the majority of us, Really, what happens is that we're far behind in income. We're only getting paid 69% of the white man's dollar. Many of us are head of household. And so now you got us on, it's like a cycle, right? And what happens is that we have things in our community that says this. So get your toe in the dough. You know, just get in there. And when you get in there, you show them. Yeah, you got to work twice as hard. But you got to show them, and once you get in there, you can, you know, perhaps get a promotion. I'm saying we need to squash that. We need to say, hey, look, you go in and you have objectives in mind, understand what your job market is about, and that's what understanding pay equity, um, going to pay equity and salary negotiation workshops will do. Is that they will teach you how to go to like a next door or places where to determine, hey, this is what's being paid in your marketplace. Mm-hmm. Um, this is what, what you need to sort of look at. I mean, I can remember when I first got my job in my family. I'm from Mississippi, like you already said. And basically for my family, I started off, and I have I like to share real numbers. I started off at like fifty six, fifty seven thousand dollars $57,000. Well, for my family, that was huge. 
Because, again, I came up, my grandparents are sharecroppers. They end up owning their own home, and I'm going to talk about that shortly. And then what happens is that, you know, and my mother, you know, she, you know, worked for the federal government, but, you know, she didn't make, you know, much money. She made enough to take care of us, but for the most part, you know, it wasn't enough, you know, it wasn't a lot. And so when they heard that number, they were like, yeah, go for it. You know, you ball it. <laughs> and mm-hmm. I didn't have people to explain to me, like, right, wait, you got to have deductions with medical. You got to pay taxes. You got to do all of that, right? So that number shrinks, mm-hmm. right? And so therefore, but one of the things I can say about me, because I was a little girl and I, I used to, I was an enterprising child. Uh, what I did is I end up, um, I know we just got a few more minutes. I, I end up basically saying I negotiated my salary. And so right now, while the average income is roughly me, a retirement um, number is uh, 460,000K, I mean, I'm well above that. But again, yeah. it came from um, salary negotiation, looking at pay equity workshops. So I know I'm going, we got to now get ready to wrap up, but one of the pieces that I want to share. We have five, is, five more minutes. Oh, okay. So one of the things that I want to say is that, um, you know, we always get the story of Black Wall Street. And one of the things that they tell us is how it was scorched to the ground. Oh, it was scorched to the ground. It was scorched to the ground. And so, therefore, in our cycles, um, if you go to our museums, they tell you that narrative. And they'll say, you know, wasn't that a shame? We got to be very careful because one of the things that conservatives have done is they have actually hijacked a lot of um, black people, or I'm going to say survivor stories. What do I mean by that? So what they don't tell you, and you can Google this for yourself, Black Wall Street was rebuilt by 1925. Mm-hmm. It was burnt to the ground in 21, and then was rebuilt by 25. Now, why am I sharing that with you? I think that as a community, we need to go back and revisit Booker T. Washington because he was spot on about economics. I'm not going to say what industries that he was spot on, but the concept. Now, what happens is that um, when you scorch something to the ground, and that they did, that was, you know, it was an awful situation, but they didn't scorch our genius to the ground. We right. knew how to make money. We know how, but we knew how the marketplace worked. So within four years, we had rebuild because we understood financial principles. And that's where Booker T. Washington was so important for African Americans, because for the most part, he stressed that economic component, like Maggie Lena Walker in Richmond, Virginia. Mm-hmm. So we have, have in Durham, North Carolina, you had these communities that truly understood the power of understanding economics and what it meant and how it related to freedom. I'm going to give you a fellow home person, um, and I say I met Fannie Lou Hamer. She did yes. not notice. She um, she basically did not know that she had the right to vote or exercise the right to vote until in her 40s. She ended up learning. I mean, she ended up, you know, fighting. And she ended up getting kicked off the plantation that she was working on. She had to go through undergo a, a huge slew, slew of violence. Um, but what happens is that she ended up, you know, start with the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party. You know, she ended up rising in the politics. But she ended up getting to, if you check her story out, people like to have her right there in 64 to like 66. But what they don't go is, again, beyond that narrative. So by 1968, 69, um, like most definitely 71, Fannie Lou Hamer has a form cooperative, what they call the pig bank. And what happens is people can come in, they got a male and a female, they made it this pig, and then what happens is they brought it back to the bank and they helped another family. Now, why is that important? Because Fannie Lou said this. She understood that politics is, you know, you have a lot of negotiations in politics. Now, what I mean by that negotiation, a lot of interpretations, and, you know, um, again, that's the way the game is sort of played there, right? And so what happens is, um, you know, they have, um, you know, so that's one of the, the elements. So now why is this so important? Because Fannie Lou realized that with politics, right, it went so far. You had to be economically independent. And so, therefore, when we look at the Fannie Lou Hamer story, we look at the um, understanding Martin Luther King was down when he got assassinated, helping Memphis sanitation workers, you know, fight for economic rights. 
Because, again, you have to look at where we stand, what's going to help us grow as a community. Now, basically, um, you know, that's where we sort of really need to be at. And so at this moment, I want to sort of, you know, um, conclude with this element. So when we look at Black Wall Street, what people what people actually see when they sort of look at it now is the 1960s urban renewal, right, that actually happened when they went into our communities and they destroyed them with um, highways. But for the most part, what we rebuild, again, was in that 25. And, again, so my, my whole overall goal is to this, understand this. We must advocate for pay equity because as black women, particularly as women, period, but as black women, we suffer for it. Right now, if we don't advocate for pay equity by the year 2091, that's when the, it's, it's projected to close. So that wow. means in my lifetime, in your lifetime, and many of the people who are on that phone, we, um, on, the, um, on the call, on this radio program right now who are listening, it will not happen um, in our lifetime. All right. Well, I'm telling you, you have taught us a class today, uh, Dr. Taylor, it has really been interesting. We're going to have to have you back again, and maybe you can uh, take it a little step further for us, because this has really been helpful. We thank you so much for being our guest today. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Let me close by saying words, thoughts, and deeds have a boomerang effect. So be careful what you send out. Scripture says, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. I hope you have enjoyed our show today with Dr. Julianne Malvo talking about politics and the economy and my son, Dr. Tim Taylor, continuing. Thank you, Tanya, for continuing to talk about the economics, in particular pay equity, something that especially African-American women need to listen to. I close with this each week. Scripture says, my people perish for the lack of knowledge. So think on these things from the Lindia Grant Show. I'm your host, Lindia Grant. Until next week, good day. Thank you for listening to the Lindia Grant Show. Think on these things with your host, Lindia Grant.